Um, before I start, I would like to mention that the project is funded by NSF and the progress that we've made so far in the project wouldn't have been possible without the help and the work of the people at UF, FSU, and also over the pond by University of Liverpool, University of Leeds, and IREP in, in France. So what is it that we are doing? This project, oh, I should also say, for those who don't know me, I'm Dan and I'm a postdoc at, at UF. I'm working with Courtney, so I'm working on this project now myself. So I think I, I'll be able to present it to you. So what is it that we are doing? We are trying to, to get the next step into studying the, the deep earth and how it evolved in the past. So you've seen this one before, and I have showed that in, I think, every presentation that I've given in the last five years. But the problem that we are facing when we are looking at deep earth evolution through time is that geophysical data that shows us the interior of the planet is only a snapshot of, of the present day state. And if we want to go further back in time, we need something else as, as a proxy to, to study it. Luckily, we have the magnetic field that is created in, in the outer core. And when you get changes in the Earth's interior, you would expect to see that as variation of the magnetic field at the surface where, we, where it gets preserved in, in rocks. So where it said no data in, in the previous slide, we can replace that with paleomagnetic data. But I have said, I've shown that a few times, but I've never really talked more about it because paleomagnetic data is only half of the equation. What we need in addition to it is predictions from geodynamic simulations. And when we do that, like there have been multiple studies who have worked on that. And the thing is there's two, let's call it wild cards that we have to that we have to look at when we do that. And that is how do we get to dynamo simulations that will tell us something useful? And what are we going to do with the results? So do I have a mouse pointer here? Does it work? Ah, yeah, okay, good. I'm gonna need that at some point. Um, so in this talk, I'm gonna walk around this circle and not as much circular reasoning, but a circular thing that we are doing because we are starting with paleomagnetic data. And what we're trying to do is we want to come back to paleomagnetic data in the end. So when we talk about the magnetic data, we care about variations in the magnetic field that are supposed to tell us something. And when we talk about variations in the magnet magnetic field, we know that they occur on, on a wide range of time scales from, from seconds to the millions or billions of years. And while the, the variations that happen in time scales from, from seconds to, to hundreds of years, we can measure them directly and we, we assume that they are caused by stochastic processes in the outer core themselves. But when we look at the variations that, that are on a, on a much wider or much longer time scale, and those are the variations that are supposed to tell us something that is not related to what's what's going on or to variations in the core themselves, but to to external um, effects such as changes in in the cooling rate or something like that. And these long term variations, we can use those to to tell something about the evolution of the planet, and we can start to try and answer questions about how long did we have a magnetic field and how did the interior of the planet look at the time when we started to get a magnetic field we can also try to answer questions about for example the age of the inner core and i think the talk after me is going to be about that so i'm not going to say too much about that even though there is now a prompt that's asking if there's a magnetic signal of it at all but it is something that that we have to look at. And the reason why I have it here is because the next slide, when we want to use all these long-term variations, we obviously have to have to use data that's going further back in time. And we all know the further back we go in time, um, the less data we have available that that we can use to identify trends and to identify this these variations that, that we do see. 
And that's quite important if we look at this image from, from Bono et al. 2022, we can see that, that the trends that have been identified through time from the paleomagnetic data that we have, in this case, from the paleo intensity data, they do tend to change with new data that, that comes in and does not comply with the trends that we, that we have found so far. So if we look at the trends in blue that have been identified in 2015 and have been argued to be a signal of inner core nucleation, they've been replaced by newer trends and newer data from 2019 that have moved the signal of inner core nucleation to, to the end of the, of the Neoproterozoic. And I would argue that our knowledge about what these trends mean for the geodynamo and the other way around uh, not at the point where we we can say exactly that this trend means this and the other trend means that. And that's shown very well by how quickly uh, the inner core age from 2015 was replaced by the one in 2019. And that can always happen again when we add more data. So what are we going to do? We're supposed to add more data. This is the only thing that will help us in in the long run, and this is what I've been done. Uh, I've been doing for for the most of my career. Let's call it that. Before I started to work on this, but so far I've only looked at variations in in the field strength. But we obviously also have a directional data, and when we talk about these really long term trends, what the thing that interests us most is reversal frequency and changes in reversal frequency. And when we do that and add changes in reversal frequency to the changes in field strength, and we might be able to see a pattern that, that we would not see if we focus only on, on paleo intensity by itself. And people have done that and looked at, at the occurrence of supercrons, and they've noticed that the spacing of the supercrons is, is somewhat similar to the, to the time it takes for for the convective overturn of the mantle. And from that, the hypothesis, hypothesis first try, uh, gained traction that the, the mantle the, or the mantle forcing is more important to the core than we had thought before. And it makes sense because the, the mantle is the controlling factor when, when it comes to how much heat gets transported out of the core. And this is important to the geodynamo as we see in, in several studies. I'm showing this one of Driscoll 20, 2016 because I really like the, the figure on the right, where they have kind of tied the geodynamic simulation to a thermal history of the core. And what they were able to show is that the dynamo changed regime into a strong dipolar a regime around 1.7 billion years. Then it switched into a weak field regime. In their case, it was around 600 MA before it changed into the bipolar and stronger regime that we that we have to this day. And it's pretty cool because that shows something that might be similar to what to what we see in the Ediacara now and and which has been um, interpreted as a paleomagnetic signal of inner core nucleation. But when you think about the mantle, it's it's not just that homogeneous shell that that transports heat out hom uh, homogeneously, because when we look at the present day state of the mantle, we can imagine that the heat flux from the core to the mantle will be different below the LLSVPs and and the areas where, where we have cold slabs coming, coming towards the mantle. So people have started to look at more heterogeneous cases of heat flux at the core mantle boundary. They've started with, with simple patterns of of core mantle boundary heat flux, and I've looked at how the field would look after applying these different boundary conditions. But I've also been been studies. There's more than this one, but I'm showing the one by Olsen et al. 2015. But they've used mantle convection models um, to get to get different patterns uh, through times as you would get them from from the plate reconstructions that are driving the mantle models. And what we are doing, so our project is, is actually pretty similar to what Osman and Al have done in, in their study, but we 
are differing, or our project is differing from theirs in, in two major points. One of them is, and I'm going to talk about this in a bit, is the time scale of the of the mantle convection model that that they are using. We really want to see the the whole range of of patterns that that we can see at the core mantle boundary, and for that we would probably need to look at least through a whole um, supercontinent cycle and see what what that does to the to the core mantle boundary. And the, the second difference I'm gonna get to a bit later because that doesn't fit to what I'm talking about now. Because now I'm at the first wildcard, which tells us how do we get to the simulations that are supposed to tell us something. And as I said, we are going to use, or we are using mantle models as they did in Osnodar 2015. And the models that we are using are run in the, in the open source software aspect. They have been run at UF by Ilana Dunberg, René Gassmer, and, and their group. So all the visualizations that I have in the next few slides have been provided by them. So the setup of the models that, that they have been using is we're using global mantle convection models, and those create space and time dependent boundary conditions for temperature, velocity, and, and composition. One of the cool things that they have done is for the material properties, they compute them using perplex and a theodynamic database so that they can get a temperature and a depth dependent viscosity model that is actually based on, on mineral data. So the, the elephant in the room is how are we driving this model? Because I said the, these models are driven by plate reconstruction. And since we want to really look at the long um, reconstruction, we are using the plate reconstruction from Meredith at all 2021, which goes back for 1 billion years. And I know these plate reconstructions get a bit more difficult once you get into the time period of the Devonian, and they're getting much, much more difficult once you get into the Precambrian. So if we were to try and get a time series of of geodynamic simulations and use the predictions to tie it back to a time series of, of the paleomagnetic record, we would have to be really cautious that these mantle models might not represent what we had on Earth throughout the whole time. But we are not doing that. We are trying to get a maximum extent of, of patterns at the core mantle boundary. So for this, this model will do just fine. Well, we actually run those models, and I hope they do. No, they do not. That's, that's okay. As long as the next one, the next one uh, runs, then it will be fine. This was supposed to show you how the slabs <laughs> go into into the the mantle and and subduct sub down to the core mantle boundary. I'm not sure why it doesn't work now. It worked in in the morning, but I hope that the next one works because what we care about. In the end, is how does the how does the geodynamo seed? How does it affect the core? And we can see that by looking at the map of heat flux at the core mantle boundary. And no, it does not work. Just it struggles with Windows and Mac. Yeah. Is the one at the, at the back? Yeah. Yeah. No, let's see. Um... Oh, are you trying? Yeah, sorry. What uh... you are hopefully going to see <laughs> is, is the evolution of the heat flux at the core mantle boundary through time while we are running the model. So at the moment, we are only seeing a homogeneous heat flux. Um, and you will see exactly the same until the first the first uh, slabs, the first port slabs, which, uh, the core mantle boundary. In our model, that, that took approximately, yay, 190 million years. This is so much better. And you can you can watch how, how the pattern changes through time. So as I said, that's, that's 1 billion years from, from beginning to start. And let me see if I can if I, yeah, let me pause it at the same time. I probably can't. No, never mind. I will show it on the next slide. 
So what you've seen um, pretty fast here was the onset of, of convection in this model and the time it took um, to be seen at the core mantle boundary. And the one thing that some people, uh, some of you might might see, but I usually have a hard time seeing it, is that the degree two dominant structure that we have today does not persist throughout the model. And I'm going to show this on this slide. This is a power spectrum of the chromatic boundary heat flux of the map that we've just looked at. I've cut off the first 200 million years because that's, that's the model ramp up and the values there are just insane and unreasonable. But what we can see here is that the degree two dominant uh, structure that we have today is not the same throughout these uh, one, one billion years. Instead, you would see that degree one was stronger at some time, and for actually a, quite a long time, we have degree two power to be to be the, the dominant power in in these these patterns. So, how does that that look like? Um, what we can now do is we can take different stages of the supercontinent cycle as we see it on on the surface, and then 190 million years later. We can we can see how that would look at the at the core mantle boundary and get the different patterns that we can use as boundary conditions for our models. And I just see this should be two hundred and twenty nine, but I'm not good at math. Right. Now that we know what we can use to start a geodynamo simulations, let's talk about those. So for uh, so far, I've I've run uh, fifty seven simulations, and the way we've done it is we have taken dynamic simulations with homogeneous heat flux at the core mantle boundary that have been run at the University of Leeds. And we've chosen them um, by looking at the magnetic field that they output. We want that to be reasonably close to Earth. And we also looked that they are within QG Mach balance. We've defined that as the, as the ratio of magnetic to kinetic energy. And we said, if the magnetic to kinetic energy ratio is at least one, maybe larger than those models would be good for, for us to use. Um, the models that we've run were in, in the range of Ackman numbers between one e to the minus three to five e to the minus four. And we've run them for, for at least two magnetic diffusion times. And as I said, we, we used as a start simulations with homogeneous boundary conditions. And um, to these, we have applied a heterogeneous boundary condition that we got from, from a tomographic velocity model from Masses et al. I'm showing it here as it was published in Mount and Davies 2017. And using this map, what we did is we have changed the amount of heterogeneity that we see in these models. This heterogeneity was here. Used to be defined by the parameter epsilon. This is now called Q star. And what it is, it is the difference between maximum and minimum heat flux divided by the average heat flux at the core mantle boundary. So these two plots, it's pretty interesting, are actually from the mantle convection model. This one shows the average heat flux at the CMB, and this shows the, the value for, for Q star that we see through time. And you can see after the initial ramp up, our total heat flux doesn't change as much through the whole through the whole model. And what surprised me a bit is that our heterogeneity also didn't change too much through the whole run. Um, before I now show you some results, I'll have to go back to this slide and talk about what are we actually doing with the results? How can we, how can we tie what we get from the geodynamo simulations to the geomagnetic field and to observables, observables that we can actually measure? And some of you might already know where I'm going with this. And you're correct. We are using QPM, the paleomagnetic modeling criteria for geodynamo simulations. Those were published in 2019 by Sprain et al. And what they do is they try to analyze output of geodynamo simulations as we would 
um, a paleomagnetic study. What we do is we create a, a pseudo paleomagnetic data set from our output of the geodynamic simulations and calculate crit uh, criteria that are based on time average field and PSV behavior. And that would be reversals, VGB dispersion, variability of the of the VDM strength, moment, yeah, and the inclination anomaly. So originally, what has been done in the original formulation of QPM was that these criteria that have been calculated from the models have been compared to, to the same criteria that have been calculated based on data from the from the last 10 million years. Now we're looking at the at a much longer time scale now, so it might not be too useful to compare our results from our geodynamo simulations to, to statistics that we get for the field from the last 10 million years, because it might have changed through time. Um, so in the original formulation, the simulation data was compared to, to this Earth-like data, which is the data from the last 10 million years. And uh, from that, uh, misfit was calculated and they were scored either zero or one, as, as it is done, for example, in the Vanderbilt criteria. Um, now, when they did that on the geodynamo simulations in, in 2019, you can see that a lot of, of simulations don't really fit those criteria of, of being Earth-like. They, they might uh, get get a good misfit for one or two, or maximum three of these criteria, but they, all the simulations are having a really hard time to to fit more than more than two at the same time. And back then, not a single simulation was able to capture the the whole range of of field behavior for the last uh, ten million years. Um, but when we look at the criteria on on its own, then we don't have to score our models uh, on, a, on a scale of zero to five to see how Earth-like they are. What we can do is we can take the criteria and take a bit of a more liberal approach, which is not something I can, I can say too much in my corner of the country, but something like this has been done by studies such as Midori et al. 2021. And what they have done is they've used the parameters to, to kind of find trends to, to, um, to what you would see from, from the geodynamo output. So in, in their paper, they've compared um, the criteria such as the VGB dispersion at the equator and the latitudinal dependence to the dipolarity. And the dipolarity F dip that they've used is defined as the time average ratio of dipole to non-dipole field strength at the CMB. And they started to see some trends that they could follow. And similarly, in, later in beginning of 2020, which is actually earlier now that I see it, um, you could see that some of those criteria can actually be used as a proxy to tell us something about other values. In this case, it's the axial dipole to non-axial dipole dominance, that there's a direct relationship to, to the BGP dispersion at the equator. So if we do the same and look at the results from, from our models, then after 30 slides of, of introduction, I can now show two slides of, of results. And there's quite a bit to unpack here. So the top, the top row that you're looking at is what geodynamo models are more interested in. The bottom uh, one is more for the paleomagnetic field. So the first one is showing the wedge that has been defined by Christensen and others in, in 2010, that kind of giving an area of where the, the geodynamo is in an Earth-like regime. It's defined by the magnetic Reynolds number and the magnetic Ekman number. If we go further to the right, then here we can see what we define as, as Mach balance, so the ratio of magnetic to kinetic energy. And for all of these plots, at least the ones that have a viridis color bar, you can see on the x-axis our values for Q star. So Q star of zero means we have homogeneous heat flux at the core metal boundary. All other values have been using the tomographic heat flux pattern, 
and we have increased the amplitude of of uh, heterogeneity for those up to a value of five, which is just a bit above what we what we saw from the mantle convection model. And uh, the final the final plot uh, top row is showing F dip, so it's similar to what Maduri et al have have published in their study. And you can already see that with increasing heterogeneity, we are starting to get um, a much lower ratio of magnetic to kinetic energy. And you see it even better here with F dip because some of these um, data points are at the, at the same point here. What I'm showing as, as plus signs or as crosses uh, geodynamic simulation where either at the very start or at some point through the run, the magnetic energy started to decay exponentially and the simulation could no longer support uh, a geodynamo. You can also see that the higher up we go with the heterogeneity, the more of our simulations have uh, have not been able to, to support a geodynamo. What we can see from paleomagnetic um, parameters that we can look at, we have VGP dispersion at the equator here. And you can see that, at least for the models that, that have sustained a geodynamo, that our VGP dispersion at the equator starts to increase as soon as we increase the heterogeneity at the core mantle boundary. And that goes hand in hand with the proportional transition time, which is the time that the dipole spends at latitudes between, I believe it was plus minus 60 degrees here. And you can see this proportional transition time rises, which makes sense. We get more reversals, we get a more unstable field, which we also see for, um, for the VGP dispersion. I believe on the next slide, I have replaced um, model GB and, and what was it? The proportional transition time with the, the values for inclination anomaly and our estimate for, for field strength. So for field strength, we show what's called V percent, and that's the interquartile range of VDM values that we that we measure at the model divided by by the median. And increasing values for V percent usually mean that the field gets that weaker, so that the dipole moment is weaker in these simulations. Um, one thing that I should that should uh, I should really mention is that what we can see here with an increasing um, model GA and changes in field strength with changes in heterogeneity, that applies to the parameter range or the parameter regime of the simulations that we've run there. And I'm saying that because there's now a few more simulations on, on this plot than I had before. They are plotted in yellow here, which is really not the greatest color to use, as I see now. But these are at a completely different parameter regime. And in contrast to the to the other simulations that we've chosen based on how well they reproduce the Earth's magnetic field, it was not the case for this one because I chose the parameters based on the plot being empty here. And I just wanted to fill it and see what happens. <laughs> um, if you do that, then you can see in the yellow points for these for these specific models, the ratio of magnetic to, kin to kinetic energy didn't change at all from, from changing the heterogeneity. And the same is true for the dipolarity. It also stays constant um, whatever, whatever Q star we are using. The problem with it is, from a magnetic field perspective, those don't look Earth-like at all. And if we, whether we compare it to the last 10 million years or further back in time, they all have VGP dispersions at the equator, values higher than 50 degrees, which I think is safe to say that's not too, too Earth-like. And I have no idea how well I'm doing on time because I'm not seeing it here. But I'm just going to come to what I'm calling conclusions here. It should probably better be called summary because from the first runs that we have, we can't see that much just yet. What's more interesting on, on this slide is what we are planning to do from this point forward and what we're doing right now. 
So the first thing that we are going to do is actually use the boundary conditions that we get from our mantle models. And if I didn't have a bit of a whoopsie moment in setting up these models, I could already show results. But as it happens, they are still running right now, or I think most of them finished last night. So if you're interested in those results, I should be able to show something later today or, or tomorrow. <laughs> if I get the time. Um, the other thing that we are going to do, or we are also doing right now, one of Courtney's students is running simulations as we speak, is when we look back in time this far, then the, then the heat flux pattern is not the only thing that changes. We also have to deal with a changing in a core size, which will probably change everything again. So what we are doing now is we are running models similar to the study of Landau et al. 2017, but we are doing it for homogeneous boundary conditions, and then we are repeating the whole thing with heterogeneous boundary conditions. At the moment, we are running it for the tomographic case, so we can hopefully figure out what of the changes that we see in the field can be attributed to changes of the inner core size versus changes in in the heat flux pattern. And after that, well, currently we are running a present day heat flux pattern from Aspect. And the next steps would be to well, try a different range of, of patterns that we get at different stages of the supercontinent cycle. And I think I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, are there any questions? Okay. Hey, uh, yeah, I noticed so even for some of your pretty homogeneous models, like the kind of the column jump left or jump right of the left, like right there, yeah. uh, even some of those you have values that died away, right? So like can you comment on yeah, do you think it's possible under realistic panel conditions that their cycle had a problem with some form of tennis? If it did, how would that behave? How long would that last? Sorry, could you ask that again? I didn't catch oh, sorry. Well, you, sorry, like, I noticed like some of the you know, fairly homogeneous models that actually like, have a sign of shutdown, right? That actually happened? Um, no, not in the cases that I've used. Like yeah, all the homogeneous. Yeah. Yes, um, but the homogeneous ones are these here. Right, but in like, even when you one, right, it's like pretty, pretty low. Yeah, um, yeah. well, this one, yeah, I'm not sure what, what's going on with this one that's pretty low. All of the others are, are producing a, a geodynamo. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, I mean, regardless of what the number of people is, like, is it, you know, in under realistic amounts of male convection induced, um, you know, heat flux energy, maybe, do you think it's possible that I know ever had a shutdown in, in history and what that would look like? Well, from increasing the heterogeneity, yeah. Well, what's interesting and what I've, I've seen in some of our simulations is that it's not uh, either it, it can sustain a dynamo or it doesn't. For some of the simulations, we have been running them for more than 10 magnetic diffusion times or the equivalent of, I don't know, two million years in that case. And the dynamo died or shut down after that. And at the moment, we don't know why, how that happened. When you look at the field, it looks like uh, the field is going through a reversal and mid reversal, the dynamo dies and never recovers. Interesting. Yeah. Great. I guess just a question about how we should be thinking about the future of down the imposing these paleo geographic boundary conditions, what we should be thinking about in terms of the time within the supercontinent cycle as you termed it, uh, that we're seeing increases in the heterogeneity, so, which are one of the, as uh, you're sort of putting that as an important variable in terms of strength of these heat dispersion. So when, when should we be thinking about this more considerations? Well, so far we've used the same pattern for all of those, and that's the present day 
the present day state. So I can't tell you what what's going to happen when I'm when I'm starting to change it up. So I hope that's well. That's that's part of what we are trying to figure out. But at this point, um, it was important to find find simulations that we can actually use for those because. Like the one that I that I showed here, if we are not in the correct parameter regime, then we don't don't get an Earth-like magnetic field in the first place. So it it really it's hard to tell what what's actually happening from from changing changing the pattern itself. And I think at this stage we are at a point where we have found simulations that we can use. And I hope I can I can answer your question next time when we actually have results for for those cases. Uh, I have a question which is um, sort of a follow-up on Rogers, and that is you indicated that you need some minimum amount of time in order to get some of this representative, you just said a couple of diffusion times. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the Earth and we look at the last couple of million years, we see we don't actually get an average value for the field strength time, even over that time. So I wonder if you've got any comments on um, whether you might need to run these for many more diffusion times, and then you also have to then to die after 10. So um, what does that tell you about what's going on here? Well, that tells me that it's really scary. <laughs> and yes, I, I would love to run all of them for, for like 10 or 20 magnetic diffusion times, but I only have that much computing time available to me. And well, it takes it takes long enough to to run them for one magnetic diffusion time, and it's my understanding that the people have said once once you run the uh, geodynamic simulation for one magnetic diffusion time, you are not supposed to see uh, big changes from what you've seen in in that time. But yeah, I'm, I'm I can't I can't support that. <laughs> It is, yeah. Um, so my other question is about the pattern of heat flux that you're going to end up with as a result of these mantle experiments. Mm -hmm. And um, does it really, do we really know how that works? Because uh, doesn't that depend on uh, details of the mantle convection experiment, including the structure in the mantle. You've got the boundary condition at the top, mm -hmm. but is that enough to tell you what's going to go on at the bottom? Well, we are using the, the mineral physics from, from the database so we can get as close as possible, but it might I might get a completely different uh, image at the at the CMB if I, for example, use a different plate reconstruction to drive it at the top, and with, that's something that we want to do as soon as we get get more plate reconstructions that that run for long enough. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a very basic question. Oh, what good. is your package? Because this is quite important for determining the time variations. Um, well, it's it's not the same for for all of the models. I I can look it up to give you give you the values right now. If it's the equivalent of of the like the models that we've run, the equivalent is uh, approximately uh, two hundred thousand years. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, Dan.